Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Good morning. My name is Judd Devermont. I'm the director of the Africa program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to this urgent conversation, Restoring Humanitarian Access in Ethiopia. This is a joint event with CSIS's Humanitarian Agenda Program. As our esteemed panelists will stress, there is a desperate and tragic crisis unfolding in the Tigray region. There are some 2 million people displaced, some 60,000 refugees in Sudan, Despite some modest improvements in the response, the UN Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs on Friday said, ongoing insecurity, bureaucratic obstacles, and the presence of various armed groups are hampering the humanitarian's ability to deliver assistance. The situation will almost certainly worsen without a strong response from the international community and from stakeholders in the region. I should say at the top, this is our second event in as many months on Ethiopia and please stay tuned for future programming. We want to spotlight the various dimensions of this crisis, including the shocking humanitarian rights abuses, insecurity in the rest of the country, and the increasing signs that it will be difficult if not impossible to hold free and fair elections under these conditions. But first, let me tell you what this event is not about today. We're not gonna spend a whole lot of time discussing who is to blame for the start of the conflict between the government and the Tigray, the former ruling party, the TPLF. To be sure, there's a lot of blame and finger pointing going around. You can just go on Twitter if you're interested in looking at the blame game. But our goal today is to focus on the millions of people in dire need of critical assistance. We're also not going to obsess over technical challenge. There are some to be sure, but this is a political will problem. After all, this is a region that has a long history of dealing with famine and conflict and displacement. The government, the TPLF, and the international community know how to respond to these sorts of challenges. I believe the muscle memory really does exist and it's possible to deliver assistance across battle lines and across borders. And lastly, as I said earlier, we're probably not gonna have enough time to touch about the other facets of this crisis, but I wanna make it abundantly clear that solving the humanitarian issue is one of several urgent tasks ahead of the international community and Ethiopian stakeholders. It has to be tackled first because of the urgency and because there shouldn't be any disagreement between combatants or the international community, including UN Security Council members that humanitarian assistance has to be restored. I wanna encourage everyone to see this as the first and necessary step to stop the human rights abuses and atrocities, including the widespread use of rape. This has to stop and the international community should start investigating and preparing to hold parties accountable for any atrocities committed. It's the first step to negotiating a ceasefire and opening dialogue between the belligerents. Indeed, this is one of the preconditions on the table. It's also the first step or arguably a concurrent step to talk about the role of Eritreans in this conflict, the escalating border dispute with Sudan and ethnic militias that are sowing violence in Amhara and Beni Shango Gamuz, the fighting in Oromia and the frictions on the Somali Afar and Oromo Somali borders. Lastly, it's the first step to talk about the scheduled elections for later this summer. It's very hard to env envision free and fair elections under these conditions. So our panelists have a crucial task ahead of them. We need to hear what's happening on the ground. We don't need any spin. We just need to focus on what are the steps that we need to take to address this devastating crisis. And we couldn't be more fortunate to have three people here who really know firsthand what's happening. And they bring a tremendous amount of experience and expertise to the table. We will be joined today by Daniel Bekele. He is the chief commissioner of the Ethiopian Human Rights Commission. He was the executive director for Human Rights Watch Africa Division and worked as a senior advisor at Amnesty International. Daniel has also served time as the research and policy director of ActionAid. Jan Ingland is the secretary general of the Norwegian Refugee Council where he oversees the work of the humanitarian organization in more than 30 countries affected by conflict and disaster. 
From 2011 to 2013, Jan served as the European Director at Human Rights Watch. He was appointed Special Advisor to the UN General Assembly, excuse me, Special Advisor to UN General Secretary for Conflict Prevention and Resolution from 2006 to 2008. And finally, Catherine Wiesner is the Head of External Engagement at the UNHCR Regional Bureau for East Horn of Africa and Great Lakes. She was previously the Deputy Assistant Secretary at the State Department's Bureau for Population, Refugees and Migration. Earlier, she served as the Principal Director to the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for African Affairs at the Pentagon. The discussion is going to be moderated by my colleague, Jake Kurtzer, who is the Director of the Humanitarian Agenda at CSIS. Jake, let me hand it over to you. Thank you, Judd, for that introduction and for our panelists for being here. Um, Daniel, I want to start with you. Um, Judd, in his opening comment, laid out the top lines of an urgent human rights and humanitarian crisis. So from your perspective with the Ethiopian Human Rights Commission, what needs to happen today to restore the safety and protection of the civilians living in Tigray? Sure, thanks, Jack. Uh, the, the war situation really has led to uh, some major uh, humanitarian situation, including civilian casualties, uh, you know, uh, deserts and the bodily injury of uh, uh, lots of people and internal displacement and uh, refugees being dispersed and uh, destruction of uh, infrastructure, damage to infrastructure and interruption of social services and the collapse of the regional government as it were, which has created a massive uh, vacuum in terms of social services and security. So all of this speaks to a lot of things that need to happen in uh, Tigray region. But let me emphasize probably on some three uh, important points from my perspective. One is the need to reestablish local level administration uh, in a way that the local level administration would be able to resume uh, social services uh, and provide security services to people and communities uh, in Tigray region. Uh, as I said, you know, it's a massive uh, vacuum because the regional government uh, practically collapsed uh, in its entirety following the war situation. So re-establishing local administration is the first thing. Uh, second thing from my perspective is the need to end the, uh, the restriction on uh, media access in the region. Uh, you know, access to information and free flow of information is even more uh, critically needed in times of emergencies and uh, um, crisis such as this. Uh, but there seems to be a feeling that, you know, given the uh, humanitarian needs and the crisis and the emergency nature of the situation and uh, the nature of the security operation on the ground as we speak, uh, there is probably not sufficient appreciation of the importance of media access. But I would really like to uh, emphasize that uh, opening up media access, both for local and international journalists, uh, is an important step uh, forward necessary. Uh, the, the third point I would say is the, is ensuring access for humanitarian assistance. Uh, and as, as Jude said in his uh, opening remark, uh, there is uh, uh, quite, a, in my view, quite a substantial improvement on humanitarian assistance and access to several parts of uh, Tigray region. But there are still uh, partly bureaucratic and partly uh, political hurdles uh, towards this, um, you know, which, which somehow continue to impede the desired level of humanitarian access and assistance. So uh, if we are to provide uh, appropriate uh, uh, protection for safety of uh, particularly civilians uh, uh, throughout the region, I would say, you know, the, the, the three points about reestablishing local administration and allowing media access and allowing uh, an improved uh, humanitarian access and assistance would be a critical step uh, forward in the right direction. Thank you, Daniel. Um, you laid out three important steps for, for the totality of the region, but I, I wanna turn to you now, Catherine, um, and think about um, a population of particular concern for you in HCR. So from your perspective, what are the top priorities to meet the humanitarian needs in the region? And particularly thinking about the refugee population, both within Ethiopia, but also crossing into Sudan. What are your priority needs uh, when you look at the picture today? Thank you. Yeah, so exactly as Judd was saying at the outset, I mean, we have a few different populations. There are the, 
There's the, the, the at-large Ethiopian population in Tigray, which was estimated at five to six million, um, one million of whom were already receiving aid before the conflict started. Um, we have the 60,000 Ethiopians who've been displaced across the border to Sudan, and that's a huge part of the response from UNHCR's perspective. And then we have refugees also from Eritrea who have been hosted in Tigray for some time. We had about 100,000 who had been registered in the region in 2019, about half of them residing in, in four camps. Um, so I think in terms of, if I start with Ethiopia, um, reaching these populations, I mean, the, the first challenge is access, that's the, that's the title of this, and, and the associated um, different issue, but associated issue of, of insecurity. So for the Eritrean refugee population who were entirely dependent on humanitarian aid, this was a, a situation of pretty extreme angst for us to completely lose contact with them for many, many weeks and to not be able to provide any basic assistance or services in the camp. Uh, Norwegian Refugee Council is one of our, our key partners in that endeavor. Um, we were happy in December when the World Food Program was able to deliver food to two of the camps and when we and partners were able to reestablish our presence there in January. But the other two camps, Shimel Ben Hitzatz, are, is a situation that you've heard our High Commissioner speak out about with a great deal of concern about the various reports of attacks on those camps, killings that have taken place, and of forced return to Eritrea by Eritrean forces. This is part of uh, what we've said on the public record in terms of the, the reports coming in. We remain with no access whatsoever to those two locations but there is the satellite imagery which shows the more or less full destruction at this point of those two camps. So the concern of um, Filippo Grande when he was recently in Ethiopia, one of the main priorities was to express to the government um, the concern of UNHCR about their responsibility to protect this group of people, about the abuses that have been reported. Um, and really now today, the urgency of being able to locate access and assist those who've been dispersed from those two camps. Um, I will say that since that, um, since that mission, and he did receive assurances from the government that that would happen, that that would happen in a, in a matter of weeks. Um, Shire is our office, which is closest to those locations where we believe the refugees have been dispersed, those who have not made it out to, um, to other areas. And, and actually at the end of last week, insecurity returned and we've, um, we've had national staff in that office throughout. We haven't, we haven't had international staff there since November. Um, we were hoping to send them this week. We actually have just asked our national staff to go shelter at home for a few days due to the situation that's there. So that insecurity continues to be a constraint. Um, overall, there has been some progress, as noted, um, particularly in the last few weeks after the visits of high-level UN officials. There have been more international personnel who've gotten the permission to return to Tigray and um, most of them to Michele so far, but I think it's still very important because it then allows us to bring the decision-making about humanitarian access and where people go on a daily basis closer to the situation. And I think this is another point that um, my High Commissioner was really stressing is that the United Nations provides humanitarian assistance in many insecure locations around the world. We have systems for doing that. We have civil military coordination. Um, and, and if we can kind of reestablish a presence, uh, then we can start to, uh, to, to work together with the government and the military actors on a daily basis to figure out where we can safely assist people. I would say the top priorities, um, certainly food is at the top. You know, people uh, were displaced during the, right at the beginning of harvest time, uh, food was already affected by the locust situation in the region. Um, and then in terms of internal displacement within Tigray, we don't really have good numbers at all. There's estimates so in the hundreds of thousands. Um, we are aware of a number of collective centers where people are living in pretty bad conditions. Um, some of them are in schools and other public buildings, but then there's whole swaths of the country, whole areas, uh, rural areas where nobody has had access and, um, and we don't actually really know the needs. Um, so our, our priority, um, in addition to being part of that response for the internally displaced, is to continue to provide assistance in the two refugee camps where we have access for Eritreans. We're starting to see some of those who were dispersed from the other two camps that have been destroyed moving, 
and we've uh, received already more than 5,000 and we are working to accommodate them quickly, but this is soon gonna be actually another crisis because the land um, is, not, is not there. We don't have enough shelter, but mostly we don't have the space and we need to really work with the government to identify what is the safe location where we can now help these people. I'll just say quickly um, uh, also uh, in terms of priorities in those camps, food, water, health, of course, came first, but this is a population that has always had a high number of unaccompanied children coming from Eritrea. So there's a whole host of protection concerns that existed before where we're reestablishing contact with those young people and their caregivers. And then you have all of these reports now of sexual violence and new concerns um, that really are priority um, while others are doing the reporting is to really focus on the fact that survivor, uh, that services should be available for survivors. Um, Sudan, very quickly, uh, the Wait, priority Catherine, has- Let me, yes, let me okay, stop can... you there. Let me stop okay. you there because um, Daniel mentioned the need for access for information. And you, you talked about the same thing that some of the areas under your concern, um, you haven't been able to access your drawing inference from satellite footage. So I wanna, I wanna turn to Jan briefly. You, you said that, um, in all your years as an aid worker, you're rarely seeing a humanitarian response so impeded and unable to deliver. So can you talk us through what are the main challenges for an organization like NRC, which works in 30 very complicated environments around the world, which works, as Catherine mentioned, in areas where insecurity is present. What are the challenges here? Why is humanitarian aid so obstructed in this context? Well, I don't really know because uh, Listen, Ethiopia is a place that has generously hosted hundreds and hundreds of thousands of refugees for very many years in, in many parts of the country, including Tigray. This is a place where we have operated in, in bad and good days. We had a hundred staff in Tigray when the, uh, the fighting started. We were helping you know, 25,000 uh, refugees, uh, Catherine of UNHCR uh, detailed whom they are, and then were cut off. Uh, we couldn't move back. We lost contact with the 100 staff. We had to, we were confined to receiving people in Sudan. I went there myself to in, at the end of November to the Sudanese Ethiopian border and heard harrowing tales from the people who, who fled across the border. Massacres, killings, horrors, really. I mean, they, these people did not flee because they wanted to. They fled for their lives. And then to, to, to be denied the most basic of things, which is access. I mean, without humanitarians having access, we cannot help civilians in their hour of greatest need. Why would they do that? I don't know. Is it to, I don't know. Is it to hide things? Is it because they don't want us to be there to see what is happening? Uh, has it improved? Yeah, to, to a certain degree. But uh, listen, I heard a lot about the 53 visas. We got one. And that was to a person who already was in Tigray, I mean, uh, in, in, in this camp uh, in the south, which is easily uh, easy to, to access. There is still no access beyond the main roads, the, uh, the capital of Mekele, uh, to certain central areas there is access. Beyond that, where there is fighting, uh, terrible suffering, starvation, we still cannot go. And it's a shame, really. We cannot accept it. I want to um, stay with you, Jan, because there's been a lot of criticism and a lot of commentary on the access challenges that are imposed on aid organizations um, by various parties, but you've also been critical of the aid sector itself in this crisis. What steps, I mean, you have an extensive career working in, in humanitarian issues with NRC, with OCHA, with various others. So what steps do you think the aid community, the humanitarian agencies themselves, uh, NGOs, UN and otherwise, should take to ensure a coordinated and, and rapid response to the crisis if access improves? Well, it, if, if it improves, we have to go to where the needs are the greatest. Problem has been, I think, that we haven't really called the spade the spade. 
you know, there's been some improvements. This, but maybe it's better next week. Maybe, maybe there was a reason we're not going, and so on. <laughs> we call a spade a spade. We were denied access for months after month after month when women and children were bleeding, when there was massacres and so on. And there was a lot, a lot of bad stuff happening from a lot of armed men. Um, so, so this, and of course, we need also to, to recognize Ethiopia has been, and is still extremely, uh, you know, uh, generous to refugees. It's a place that is extremely efficient in helping people. You know, I mean, we're Americans and Europeans here, uh, a lot of us. Ethiopia has been much more generous than we have been in Europe and, and, and North America of late. So, but, but it doesn't mean that we have to excuse when we see horrible suffering happening while we are sitting and observing from a distance. We do, still do not know what's happening in Tigray in many parts. We know it's really bad. We do not know how bad it is up until this day. Thanks, Jan. I, I want to come back to you, Daniel, because we, with, with Catherine and Jan, we've talked a little bit about you know, external organizations and the challenges they face, but you're, you're based in country. Um, so you know, for our audience in Washington, can you tell us a little bit about what work the Human Rights Commission is doing now to advocate on the humanitarian access questions um, and, and how that works either hand in hand or as a separate line from the work that the international organizations are doing? Sure, thanks, Jake. Yeah, um, this has been one of our um, advocacy uh, points uh, from very early on the, at the start of the, the war situation uh, in Tigray region. Uh, uh, we've been pressing with a, a message for humanitarian assistance and humanitarian access uh, from the very early days of uh, November. We have uh, both a private and a public advocacy engagement and we engage with government at the highest level. Uh, and we've been very clear from, uh, from the start of the conflict that uh, international humanitarian law and international human rights law uh, is applicable here, uh, as well as uh, the, the international refugee law as well, because as, uh, uh, as my uh, other colleagues uh, mentioned, you know, Tigray is a host to several uh, thousands of, uh, tens of thousands of refugees, as, uh, as Ethiopia is a host to hundreds of thousands of refugees. Uh, so there is uh, um, an implication to both civilian population as well as to the refugees. And uh, uh, one of our advocacy messages from uh, very early on uh, was uh, on the need for civilian protection, on the need uh, uh, of both, on not just the need, but also the legal uh, responsibility of all parties to the conflict to comply with uh, the international humanitarian law applicable under the situation and making sure that uh, civilians have access to uh, basic uh, necessities and needs uh, has been one of uh, our uh, important advocacy message. And I would just add that uh, as part of that advocacy message, one of, one of the messages has also been on the establishment of a humanitarian assistance desk at the level of the, uh, the federal government and, uh, and the need for better civilian and military coordination to ensure that, uh, that the humanitarian assistance better reach uh, the people in need. Uh, I do understand that there has been a bit of disagreement among the international humanitarian agencies and the government on how best uh, this can be coordinated. But in my view, uh, it is one of, uh, it's a situation which basically requires better civilian military coordination. And uh, this is not the first uh, conflict uh, a situation where humanitarian assistance needs to be delivered to uh, people uh, in need of the assistance. So, you know, better coordination of the operation would be uh, would be useful, and we've been pressing on that advocacy message. Thanks. I, I'm going to turn it back to Catherine here um, because we've heard um, from Jan and now from Daniel about this both the government having a history of being able to respond and, and having this capacity to the civil military coordination issues. So I'm, I'm wondering if you have anything you want to reflect on that. But and then secondly, I cut you off earlier when you were starting to talk about Sudan. So I'd love it if you could take us back there and and a little bit about what you're seeing in terms of the needs and the challenges to respond um, either from the Sudan side or cross border to this humanitarian crisis. 
Thanks. I think, you know, on this issue of um, civil military coordination and that aspect, it's, I think it's, it's critical. You know, the initial narrative was this is an operation that will conclude quickly and then we'll be able to go back and put everything you know, back in order again. And, and here we are more than three months on and we're still seeing insecurity in, in many different locations. So I think that, that's, what, that that's the understanding that we all need to reach now that we're dealing with the need to develop, to, to deliver a massive relief operation in a still somewhat insecure environment and that all the actors have to be committed to that before the situation gets completely out of control and, and difficult to bring back from the brink for civilians. So I think, you know, while the government has the responsibility to ensure security of all the international humanitarian actors, that's very clear. I know they take it seriously. That cannot be a facade for just continuing to, um, to deny access. So that's what I would say there. On the regional response, I think it's important to note that um, Sudan and also Djibouti in the small um, way in which they've been involved, um, regional um, neighboring governments have really done the right thing in keeping their borders open to refugees. So Sudan has kept its border open throughout. Um, at one point, there were more than a thousand people arriving a day. That number has gone down significantly. Um, to just kind of dozens arriving a day, but, um, but it's been a real challenge um, to launch the relief effort there in basically um, a very remote part of the country. So getting staff, supplies, maneuvering where the roads aren't even clear, um, identifying locations where we could move people away from the border, all of that has been difficult. Um, and that's actually really our priority today is to continue to move people as quickly as possible away from the border. That's very much um, due to the increasing tension on the border. So however that, um, you know, the conflict inside Tigray has led to this tension on the Sudan-Ethiopia border, that's a direct threat to the refugees there and to the, the aid operation there. We always try to move refugees away from the border, but that's become um, more urgent. And then we also have the, the rainy season coming in May which makes large parts of that area also inaccessible. So those are kind of the dual issues that we're contending with in, in Sudan. Um, and as I noted just quickly, you know, Djibouti, we put in place some preparations. Um, not very many people have crossed the border, but the government has been very good about um, also registering Tigrayans who found themselves in Djibouti and couldn't go back home to provide them, to, to provide them with protection there. Um, yeah. Thanks. Uh, I want to turn to you, Jan, and then I'm going to come to you, Judd, for because I want to start. We, we've, I think, captured effectively, um, you know, the the urgent human crisis that's happening on the ground, and I think we have a, a fairly clear picture of um, some of the obstacles. But Jan, NRC facilities that had been set up were recently attacked by unknown um, militants, and I want to start to to look at um, solutions or actions the international community can take. Um, how do you, as a as a humanitarian organization, you know, respond when there's an attack on on humanitarian infrastructure? And what do you think? What can what steps can be taken to prevent future attacks, either um, on your own or in in consultation with donors and other international actors? I mean, it's true that uh, it was heartbreaking to see that buildings we put up at at great effort in the Shambela and Hitsas camps are destroyed. We can see it on satellite, but we cannot go there in person to inspect. And, and, and more importantly, I mean, buildings can be rebuilt, but there was fighting in the refugee camp. These were Eritrean refugees that came to Ethiopia because it was safe. Then armed men coming into the, uh, to the camp shooting at will, burning the buildings. And then now we don't know, we, we know, uh, the, the, Catherine, you, 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 you mentioned that a few thousand we have uh, accounted for. Many, many thousands we cannot even account for. That's the most important thing. These are, these are human lives. These are vulnerable refugees. We were supposed to be there in the hour of greatest need. We were prevented from going there. Our own staff had to flee for their life. So it's, it's as graphic as that, really. Um, and, and what should be done? Listen, the, the, the diplomatic community should really wake up and really make it clear that there is no alternative to unimpeded access for 
the humanitarians. I, I like uh, Daniel Bakelis' uh, idea of a sort of one-stop shop for, for humanitarians to go to, <clears throat> but, uh, but, but often, often those places become bottlenecks, a lot of applications, a lot of bureaucracies and so on. Basically, there should now be, in my view, a, a, an order saying these reputable international organizations UNHCR, NRC, all of the other international NGOs, uh, Ethiopian Red Cross, etc., can go, will not be stopped, and you can negotiate then also access yourself to the opposition held areas. We've done that a million times, and uh, NRC is in <coughs> opposition controlled areas all over the world. We have we're in eight provinces that are virtually held by the Taliban. In, in Afghanistan. I, I have crossed a million cross lines myself, some of them with Catherine here present in, 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 in the old days. Um, we can do it. We're, we're held back. And one of, one of the things that's happening is, of course, the federal government says, you can go. The local government says, no, you cannot. Then the local government says, but these people can go. Then the federal government says, no, you cannot really. Uh, we need a blanket uh, blanket action. It, we have no time to lose, really. Thanks. Um, we have a question from the audience that I want um, our panelists to think about while I put the next question to Judd, which is um, the suggestion of a, a special rapporteur for, for the Human Rights Council to, to assess um, you know, what's happened and, and ensuring that they have a proper mandate. And if that's something that you can, you can support, um, what it speaks to, I think, is the recognition in the United States and in, in the UN and elsewhere in the world of the urgency of this crisis. And recently last week, there was reporting, Judd, that the US government is considering the appointment of a special envoy. This is something you've written about um, as a, you know, on the one hand, it's an indicator of attention, but it also presents some challenges. So how do you see um, that decision? What are the pros and cons for the US, for the US side to appoint a special envoy for this crisis? Yeah, thanks, Jake. My colleague, uh, Colin Thomas Jensen at USIP wrote a piece uh, about two weeks ago on this issue. We wanted to draw from our personal experiences and, and looking at the history of US envoys to the region. And just putting my cards on the table, I have a lot of reservations about envoys or the proliferation of envoys. But given that we don't have a US ambassador in Sudan, we don't have a US ambassador in Eritrea, our ambassador to Ethiopia is on her way out. And given how urgent the crisis is, um, there is merit, but let's talk about how do you get it right. And this is where I think I'm most concerned about. To get this right, you need to make sure that envoy has access to power, meaning that he or she speaks for the president or the secretary of state, really can sort of speak in on their behalf. You need to make sure that the envoy has a strong relationship with state and with USAID. They're going to sit probably in the State Department. They have to have those relationships that work. They can't be confrontational. They, they can't be working at cross purposes. You need to make sure that the envoy really does own the process in the interagency, not, not just one of many players, but is the sort of the key person driving, driving meetings, bringing together the US government to address this issue. And these last two, I think are really important. First of all, they have to have robust staffing. When people talk about envoys, they think about Richard Holbrook and he's gonna go negotiate the Balkans. That's not what envoys often look like in the US government on Africa. They have one, maybe two people that work for them. So if you're gonna really do this, you need to make sure that they have real staffing so they can do the kind of diplomacy one needs. And I think concurrent with that is having the resources, right? Having actual, some purse strings to be able to push these issues. Otherwise, we're just talking about symbolism and we're, we're just trying to show that we, we care and not really actually have someone who can push this issue, represent the US government in all of its facets and actually drive towards a conclusion. So thanks, Judd. Thinking about that, I wanna come back to this question about, you know, is there merit for um, people pushing for a special rapporteur at the UN level? I wanna to turn to you, Daniel, um, you know, as, as a national human rights body, um, where do you come down on this question? Do you believe that the UN should put together a special rapporteur given the challenges of getting accurate information and having a clear picture of what's happened and what continues to happen today. 
I mean, uh, whether it is from the UN or Ethiopia's uh, friends and Ethiopia's development partners uh, wanting to come and see the situation is an opportunity for them to understand uh, the context and to get a good feel of uh, the situation on the ground. So I, I'm not necessarily averse to any of such initiatives and I, in my view, I welcome them. Uh, but I think it's also very important to keep in mind that uh, any of the international mechanisms are, um, are in principle supposed to be complementing uh, a locally led and nationally led initiatives. And when you have a nationally led initiatives, which uh, seems to be working, uh, such as my own commission, which is trying to investigate the human rights uh, situation and trying to report on what we are finding to the extent we are able to get access to the places that are accessible. Uh, uh, it, is, it is important to uh, keep in mind that you, uh, the, the international mechanisms are also supposed to be complementing uh, national processes, national mechanisms and uh, national institutions. And you know, this, this idea of uh, uh, flying in and flying out uh, quick missions uh, are not really sustainable way of uh, following up and responding to the needs uh, on the ground. And we have, uh, you know, we have had a lot of experience over the years about the limitations of such kind of initiatives, unless it is designed in a way that it complements national mechanisms and processes. But otherwise, I mean, you know, uh, any initiative from the international community uh, should be welcomed as, uh, as a good gesture of uh, getting a sense of the context and trying to support uh, the country in the time of uh, in terms of its needs. Thanks, Daniel. I mean, we've, we've talked a little bit um, in some of the earlier questions about the importance of coherence between the Ethiopian government, which has in the past demonstrated some capacity to manage a response like this. So here you're, you're tying it onto the question of accountability and, and the human rights that an international process needs to be um, coherent with the, um, you know, an Ethiopian-led process. So I think that's important. I want to I want to turn to to Jan and Catherine now, though, on a question about um, the humanitarian architecture. People have started to talk about things like um, a declaration of an L3 emergency. Um, do you think that's necessary? And, and what are the pros and cons, you know, for um, uh, animating the UN system in that way, um, given some of the challenges that already exist on the ground? Maybe Catherine, why don't you go first? Sure. The L3 declaration, which mobilizes a, a system-wide scale up, I don't think it's necessary per se, but I also don't think, um, I wouldn't write it off. And as I understand, it's still under discussion. And um, the reason why I don't say it's, 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 um, it, it's necessary um, for sure is that most of the agencies have already actually done a version of scale up. I mean, we deployed emergency teams, um, tapped into reserve funding. And so, and uh, the, the interagency standing committee already, they did appoint a deputy humanitarian coordinator realizing that the, um, you know, the team in country might not be um, perfectly staffed for this type of response. They sent in um, civ mill coordinators with OCHA. They sat in Addis for quite some time. So I think that's that's the challenge is that, you know, even if we make the decision to scale up, we still have the access problem. And it's and it's I think it's probably been unclear to the senior leadership whether the declaration of an L3 emergency was going to help or hinder that access problem. Um, but I think with access, um, we clearly need a massive scale up. And so to the extent that um, the L3 would push that further, I think it's 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 fine, but a number of agencies can still choose to, to do that and, and have done. Yeah, and how do you see that? I mean, having worked in the system, you know, in the UN and now at, at an NGO, I mean, how do you see um, the scaling up as necessary um, or is it is it overcomplicating a situation um, that may be manageable if some of the access challenges are resolved. Well, what I would like to see is an L3 in uh, in diplomacy, in advocacy, in uh, in getting things moving. But it's I mean there are virtually hundreds and hundreds of humanitarian workers ready and eager to go. There are large fleets of trucks big warehouses full of the stuff needed in Tigray that have not gone there. Or it's gone to places like Mekele, which, which was spared. There, were, there wasn't fighting in Mekele, it's, it's, it's a normal city. But in Western and Central Tigray, 
there is there is zero um, access. So so that's what I I I, I still would like to see the UN pr providing the leadership that is required by the UN to open the door for us as humanitarians, the US government, the Europeans, the African Union, which is nowhere to be seen, to, to help the basic access to places. I mean, se Central and Western, be great, zero access, zero uh, today. And it's not going to be the 53 visas that, that help that one. So I think we have to go uh, L3 of, of of calling a spade a spade rather than L3 of filling up warehouses that are already filled up. If you Thanks. get my feet. Thanks, Jan. Um, we have, I think it's indicative of the level of urgency of the crisis and the importance of Ethiopia um, in the broader picture that we have some 56 questions from the audience that we will not get to. But many of them have touched on the question of um, other other emergencies or other points of tension in the in the context. So I want to come back to you, Judd. Um, in your opening statement, you talked a little bit about um, the broader frame um, that that uh, Tigray is not the only potential flashpoint in Ethiopia. And so, you know, do you think a broader frame is necessary when looking at Tigray, or do we have to consider instability in in Amhara, Somalia, far regimes as well? Yeah, Agents. thanks, Jake. Yeah. You know, I think the Tigray is the most severe and most acute crisis in Ethiopia, but is far from the only crisis. Um, some of these issues have to do with the inadvertent um, reforms or sort of the reforms of Prime Minister Abiy, which are welcome, but have created a lot of stresses inadvertently. Some of them have to do with the strains um, of, of governance and the way in which uh, dissidents have been treated. Some of them have to do with uh, the growth of, of militias and the redistricting or, or on the ground redrawing of borders. And we do have to look at all of these crises is, is one because we're not going to get to elections where we have uh, fighting in Oromia, where we have Amhara militias in Beni Shangul fighting, where we have these border disputes. We have to think more broadly about you know, what was a hopeful message from the prime minister when he came to power in 2018 that I think many of us can agree on, but the challenges right now, this has hit the rocks and we can, again, we can spread blame all around all we want, but we have to get to the point where there are many people in Ethiopia who are frustrated, who are becoming disillusioned. And in cases like in Tigray, where they are not able to access humanitarian, you know, get that humanitarian assistance they want. So strongly believe that we have to think more broadly than just Tigray. We have to look at all the challenges that I know that Daniel's looking at himself. But if we don't do that, um, I think we're going to miss the bigger challenge that this country faces right now in this really critical moment. Thanks, Judd. I mean, I want to turn to you, Daniel, you know, again, as as a representative of an Ethiopian government, um, an Ethiopian institution, um, can you speak to a little bit about the importance of situating this in, the, in a broader context? And then also, I mean, we've got a couple of questions about the work of the Ethiopian Human Rights Commission to date. And, and earlier you spoke about the importance of dialogue. So what steps are you taking to bring people from all sides together um, to improve the humanitarian resp response and create the conditions that would allow for a more effective humanitarian response? Uh, on your point about the broader frame, I think that's a fair point, and I agree that uh, you know Ethiopia's uh, reform process is facing some serious challenge. Uh, uh, but but at the same time, uh, it's encouraging to see that uh, Ethiopia's top leadership is still committed to the reform agenda, uh, despite the complicated challenge. And uh, part of uh, uh, the the problem is also. Uh, something Ethiopia has uh, inherited from its past, but, uh, but another part of the problem also emanates from the opening up of political space. Uh, Ethiopia's new political chapter started by opening up political space and civic space for, uh, uh, for, for all Ethiopians across the globe. And, uh, you know, I think uh, uh, both uh, good players and bad players have entered into the space and uh, uh, it has not gone well uh, since the opening up of political space in Ethiopia. But 
uh, you know, despite the challenge, uh, Ethiopia still has an opportunity to continue to build on the uh, reform process, and it would be important for Ethiopia's international friends and partners uh, to look at the, the broader picture and the, the, the importance of the reform agenda and how the reform process can be supported to continue to build on uh, what Ethiopia has achieved uh, over the last couple of years. Uh, coming on to your uh, specific question about, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the importance of uh, uh, dialogues and conversation for political problems and political disputes is, uh, is, is a right one, but uh, for us as a national human rights institution, uh, that's not exactly within our mandate to, to facilitate political processes. Uh, we are mandated with the task of uh, uh, promoting and the promotion and protection of human rights, and that's uh, where we largely focus on. Uh, but I do understand the, the importance of a meaningful uh, political dialogue and uh, political process to deal with Ethiopia's complicated political crisis. Uh, uh, Tigray region is, uh, is only one of uh, the places where we have uh, political problems, but Ethiopia's political problems is much more deeper than that. And unfortunately, uh, we have seen how violent conflicts unfolding along ethnic lines and religious lines in the past has led to a lot of senseless deaths, destruction, displacement, and massive human rights violations uh, and a war situation, you know, is 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 definitely ugly. Uh, and and uh, in many of its faces, Ethiopia sadly uh, is back into such a war situation, unfortunately. But it is not uh, an insurmountable challenge uh, for Ethiopia to be able to continue to build on its uh, reform agenda. Thanks, Daniel. We are we're starting to run short on time, so I'd like to turn maybe to Catherine and then to Jan for some final thoughts. I mean, Catherine, looking, looking at this humanitarian picture, um, you know, what, what, first of all, can you just give us a picture of the funding situation and, and the deficit or what's needed, but then can you just broaden the scope a little bit and, and from the perspective of UNHCR, you know, any comments for our viewing audience of what's needed at this moment in time and, and where we can think about putting our efforts forward? Sure. So at the beginning of the crisis, the humanitarian community in Ethiopia put out a three-month appeal. It was a quick um, sort of flash appeal um, estimating really what, uh, what they thought the needs would be. Um, and that three-month plan has been about 70% funded, but what the operate, and which is not bad, but it was really very initial. And what um, what the whole country team is now working on is the, um, the plan for all of 2021. We're already in February, it's true, but um, I think the, the, the hope is that that will re be released in the next week or so. And that is actually the whole humanitarian response plan for Ethiopia, responding to questions about other flashpoints and other displaced populations in Ethiopia. Indeed, there are about 1.8 million displaced people in other parts of Ethiopia. Um, so that plan uh, it covers all of Ethiopia, but will specifically represent the new estimates based on whatever assessments we have been able to conduct in the last few months of people in need in Tigray and, and probably a much larger, larger dollar figure for, for the coming year. Um, for the interagency response in Sudan, we had a, a plan that UNHCR put together with 30 partners. It's about $150 million to take us through June. That has been about 50% funded. So the, the crisis has actually gotten some attention in terms of funding. Um, it's, it's really just going to come back then to this, this access issue um, and, and making sure, of course, on our side that we are as positioned as possible to be able to respond and provide aid every place that's accessible to us at the, at the scale required and continue to push I very much agree at the political level with the support of all of the um, key donor governments to our institutions. I support all, all high level engagement and um, in that respect um, to really establish the access that's needed. I, I will close on that point, thanks. And I wanna to turn to you for sort of final thoughts. I mean, uh, this, the L3 for diplomacy is great. Um, you know, you know, you've been in the system. So, you know, talk us through what do we need to hear from the Secretary General? What do we need to hear from the Security Council? What do we need to hear from donors to help move this forward? Well, I'm, I'm glad we're discussing Ethiopia and I mean, and not uh, just Trump or uh, European Union's crisis or whatever. I mean, Ethiopia is extremely important. It's, it's a truism. I mean, it's one of the most ancient civilizations on earth. 
<laughs> they gave a lot to us, the, the other civilizations. Now we need to be there for them. Uh, and, and it is a complex country. Uh, I, I was in, 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 in the southern area, the tribal areas where there was a lot of fighting two years back in a place called, called Dilla. I was shocked by the kind of violence that was there among these ethnic communities. And I was shocked by the lack of presence of, 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 of real support for, for these people and the lack of attention to that local conflict. So um, Ethiopia needs attention, it needs to support, it needs us to be there, it needs to enable us to help them help themselves, make it possible for us to do our job. Uh, and then Ethiopia, which has been a, also an area of stability, given all of the ho ho horrors of South Sudan, of Somalia, and all of these other places, we need Ethiopia to succeed. We need to be there. So I'm, I'm glad you you have to be on it, uh, Jacob and uh, Chad, uh, and and get also America to be a little bit interested in uh, in, in the rest of the world, including uh, in Africa. And uh, and I will work here uh, with uh, the Europeans. Thank you, Jan. I think you you captured it very effectively. The the importance is too great, and the needs are too great. And we'll continue to do our part, but on behalf of Judd and, and our programs at CSAS, I want to extend our, our sincere gratitude to you, Jan Eglon from the Norwegian Refugee Council, Catherine Wisner from UNHCR, and Daniel Bekele from the Ethiopian Human Rights Commission for spending some time with us this morning and, and sharing what you know and, and giving us some things to think about as we continue to work on this issue. And thank you all of you in the audience for joining us today, and we look forward to working with you as well. Have a good day.